I evolve every time I come here. I feel echoes of past lives here in the quiet of the wilderness. This is my religion. Steve Boys has a deep passion for Botswana's Okavango Delta. An ornithologist and zoologist, he's obsessed with conservation and the natural world. And he just happens to be the only South African fellow of the National Geographic Explorers Society. Once a safari guide, 12 years ago, Steve took on the task of preserving what he calls our vanishing real wilderness. In this case, the Okavango Delta, the beating heart of a classic African oasis. It's a place of television and photographic legend. I'm going to take you back 100,000 years to a place that connects us to eternity. The Okavango Delta is unique. It's the only inland delta on Earth, an unexpected, happy chunk of green in the vast, arid and brown Kalahari sand system. Its fertile floodplains have long supported both a remarkably diverse number of creatures and plants and humans. But there is a threat to this natural harmony. A local population explosion has seen a dramatic reduction in the numbers of fish, birds and wildlife outside protected areas. And Namibia has long wanted to dam the river that feeds the delta. Part of Steve's mission, aided by other conservationists, is to have the delta declared a World Heritage Site. I will not uh, give up until we have wrapped the Okavango Delta in as many layers of legislation to conserve it. Um, part of that is World Heritage Status, but it's only the beginning. Steve is a regular on the International University Lecture Circuit. He says it's the water, liquid gold in such arid areas that is ironically the cause of a problem facing the Delta, and that the annual record floods of recent years have exacerbated the situation. Now that water is pushing a lot of these large, the large game species out of the edges of the Delta, and that puts them in conflict with people and poachers, poachers from Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, not necessarily just Botswanans. Right now, the Okavango Delta needs an international effort to conserve it. In his effort to raise awareness about the Okavango Delta's fragile status, Steve left the comfort of his office, drove to Botswana, and pulled 300 kilometers down the length of the Delta in a mokoro, or traditional canoe. He was joined by his wife and brother, both scientists. Along the way, they would collect unique research data and seek out a wilderness quite possibly never visited by man. What amazed me was the purity of it all. Um, actually being able to drink from the river, just putting my cup or whatever it was into the, the river right next to me in a little stream and it was pure and I could just drink it. Dr. Kirsten Wimberger is a primatologist. She was in charge of data collection on the expedition. I was just going to be helping Steve collect uh, the data for his wetland bird survey, writing down the bird sightings, GPSing, uh, the changes in habitat. Did you get him? Yeah. She was also tasked with the job of taking swab samples in search of prevalent diseases in frogs. Shame, little guy. At least we've got a swab. Trying to help future frogs. I literally kept having to think. This, this isn't real. I've never seen just animals doing their thing, you know, all these species coexisting, living their lives, and with no human management or intervention or anything. In being newly married to Steve, Kirsten has acquired a brother-in-law, Chris Boyd. Marine biologist and surfer, his academic background performs a vital function with regard to the data collected. It's a discipline. It's, it's about repeatability. It's about being consistent. And it's a way of looking at things no matter what your expertise might be on. And while the academics got busy in the bush, film director Matthew Khalil was preoccupied with making a network TV series. Yeah, I mean, the challenge for me was trying to like focus on the production stuff, but also giving them enough freedom to just do what they do, you know, and kind of, so I couldn't like stop them and say, let's do that again. And in as much as Matthew had to let Steve and his team get on with their work, it was also the technical side of a serious TV production. 
So we had an octocopter camera, which is a camera on you know, propellers, which kind of flies in the sky. That was great, except it crashed on day three, so we didn't have it anymore. Uh, we had uh, another camera on a support boat, an alley boat, which was doing beauty. Then we had uh, four cameras strapped to the Macoros. We had a GoPro, two or three of them, an underwater camera, and then we had our main camera, our A camera, and a B camera. So altogether, 13 cameras, which was kind of traveling with us um, every single day. For Steve, who thrives in the simplicity of real wilderness, it had the makings of a planning nightmare. By the time we got to day 14, we were a day and a half behind. Um, but the last two days, um, because of the film crew and our schedule, um, were brutal. Feet hurt it like hell. Uh, yeah, I'm just feeling washed out. I sat down next to my tent now, and... Uh, I couldn't get up. Taking all of the boys' energy was polling the Mokoros, and just in case you thought otherwise, it isn't as easy as it looks. Maneuvering through hippo paths for 18 days in such diverse habitats and uh, conditions, you never can be truly prepared for those things. It's, it's difficult. It's very, very difficult. It took training here at Sunflay in Cape Town, um, and that was three, four times a week, as many hours as you can manage in a day. Um, just learning how to pull properly and proficiently so that you can take yourself safely past hippos. Uh, remembering that you've got five macorals that also want to get past behind you, so you can't make a mistake because you put them in trouble too. Every single meter you're moving through the water, you're making split-second decisions on where you're going to go, and you cannot miss a sign that comes in front of you, or you might miss something that could be life-threatening. Chris and Steve boys have been visiting the bush since they were kids. As Steve puts it, stick insects with binoculars. I can't imagine any other way of, of undertaking these expeditions other than with my brother, my wife and, and our close friends. Steve and Chris have a visibly strong bond, but Chris says Kirsten added a new dimension to this, their latest adventure. She's quite a, quite a tough lady out there. She, she brings a feminine touch. So she also wants to be part of the team and not be looked after by everyone else. She wants to be her own contribution and not be a hindrance to everyone. So she was amazing. She really helps us in every facet of the trip. I'm a little bit tired, even though I didn't actually do anything. Steve, my husband, the hero, pulled me along. Felt a little bit like Cleopatra. Having my wife on this, this last expedition was the first time I've had her there and it, it absolutely made a dream come true for me. Um, just to share that, it's, uh, I tell you when I'm out there, it's the only time I ever get broody. I, I, I just want to share it with uh, the kids I don't have yet and, and with my wife and my brother. <laughs> <laughs> yet it wasn't all family bonding and gorgeous scenery. They were far from anywhere and anyone. Uh, we have very little support. There's no helicopter to come and rescue you. At night, you're on your own. Um, if an emergency was to happen, it would happen um, that an hour, two hours before any kind of help would come. The boys had wanted an unassisted crossing, and they'd got it. They were pretty much on their own, except for the crucial help and literal guidance of the Bayeyi, the river bushmen of the Delta. Steve attributes everything he knows about the Delta to the Bayei, in particular to an elder known as Comet, the only man Steve knows who can find his way into the heart of the Delta. They are the people of the river. They're the first people to actually get into the Delta. I mean, the Okavango Delta, 150 years ago, not one human being had been into those core wilderness areas we access now today. It takes us eight days of polling to get in there. Comet had taken them to a place of apparently almost mythical beauty. The city-based film crew was stunned by the otherworldliness of it all. I mean, I've never seen nature like that before. It's, it's like a joke. It's like something out of a Disney cartoon, you know. It's like the bushes just clear and it's just animals everywhere. And I mean, I was in tears and the rest of the film crew were as well. It just it does overwhelm you eventually. The expedition also fell in love with the nights and the life they brought with them, like the games and music around the fireplace. By building these bridges between our world and this last wilderness, the boys have helped make this inaccessible paradise something for the world to share in. And if Steve's dream of World Heritage Site status comes true, the Okavango is a place that won't just be an African myth to our children.